All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks uh, to everybody who joined us on Thursday morning for the 9 a.m. slot uh, to talk a little bit about open sourcing communities. We'll try to make it as exciting of a topic as we possibly can. Um, if anybody needs to step out and get coffee, completely understood. We've had to do that a couple of times ourselves. So my name is Rob Wilmoth. I'm a principal architect for Red Hat, uh, focusing in the telecommunications vertical. So this will be somewhat telecommunications focused of a presentation. Alicia. Hi, uh, good morning. I'm Alicia Bella, and I'm an assistant vice president at AT&T with the title Inventive Science. So I am in the research organization. So I hope to share some of the experiences that uh, AT&T and specifically my organization has had on, in open source over its uh, very storied history um, throughout this talk today. So what are we going to talk about? Uh, we're basically going to go through a brief history of where the open source movement began, uh, how it got its start, why it got started, uh, a little bit about today, where things stand, uh, how everybody's kind of collaborating, working together, what the service provider industry is actually using open source technologies for, what the ecosystem looks like, and then finally, how to actually get involved, what you want to do, what not to do, how to you know, work within a community ecosystem because it's much different than working in a proprietary ecosystem. So where did we begin and why did this whole thing start? A long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, users wanted more control. They wanted to be able to actually look at the code, get under the hood, see how things work, what makes them tick, uh, and really understand and have the ability to influence what the technology is doing. From a training perspective, it's a much better ecosystem to be able to get your hands on things, learn how it works, what makes it tick. Security through obscurity is something that we've all heard of and we've all seen in the industry. Uh, this open source movement took that out of the equation. From a stability standpoint, you know, we're at OpenStack Summit. It's on its, I don't remember the release number, but it's been released several times. We've seen the benefits of it becoming more and more stable throughout the releases. Innovation, uh, again, we're at OpenStack Summit. I think that pretty much goes without saying. So just to, to tell you a little bit about the history of AT&T with open source, it really dates back decades. If I um, look back at like the 70s or so, um, we were giving away um, Unix to research and government institutions at no cost. However, um, in about the 80s or so, we actually were charging for Unix patches when we actually delivered it. And so it's safe to say that the model for open source um, within a company such as ours has definitely evolved along with, I think, the industry as a whole. And so it is really um, most recently that we've um, gotten onto the bandwagon of realizing that open source is really the way to move technology forward, to be leaders in an industry, to be able to uh, uh, put our hands around how do you create something that is massively uh, challenging from a technological perspective when you know you can't do it all yourself. Uh, no one organization or development group can do it alone. Um, it needs the millions of lines of code that the community can generate and the thousand people days that go into it if we are to be successful. So, you know, it's interesting really also to watch um, AT&T's involvement in this whole push towards disaggregating software from hardware because also historically at the time when uh, we were selling some of the um, this software like Unix and patches to it, there was also this software and hardware that were competing and hardware manufacturers were producing software products that were bundled. And now we're also disaggregating software from hardware so that we can get to the point where we're here today being able to offer up software to the community. So just a quick, uh, a quick timeline of events. Um, you can kind of see that as Alicia alluded to, this has been going on a long, long time. The transition is what we're kind of focusing on today. How do you actually transition from being a standard organization that's working in either a proprietary model or as a consumer of open source technology and look at that transition into being a leader 
in the open source community or a leader of communities, depending on how your organization uh, plans to work. So where are we today? Why are people continuing to do this? Why is OpenStack Summit? Why is the Linux Foundation? Why are all of these things so powerful within our industries? The amount of innovation and the fact that you can actually get something from thought concept all the way into something that is reasonably you know, stable as a code base and as an application is really what is driving this whole thing forward. How do you work with other organizations within your industry and other industries to achieve a common goal? The business process. So what we mean by that is how, what we want to do is actually take a look at how individual businesses are leveraging this technology. From a time when maybe even just as short as five or 10 years ago, we had issues with legal teams that said, no, we can't use open source. We can't have it in our walls. We don't understand it. We don't know what to do with it. We don't want to take on the liability or the risk. So you have businesses emerge, such as Red Hat, that are actually mitigating that risk by providing these enterprise features, enterprise life cycles around it, and really giving you the value uh, that comes along with open source. As far as popularity goes, you know, again, we're at OpenStack Summit. 325,000 plus uh, project on SourceForge, 10 plus million in GitHub. We're actually seeing situations where there are so many different projects that there are actually project consolidations going on. Trying to figure out how do these two things, even though they're just about the same, compete, why not just merge them together? Let's go ahead and get all the resources focused on a common goal. So, one of the other notions that we're finding is that a lot of these technologies are actually landing in key areas, whether that be cloud applications, systems management, networking, storage, infrastructure. And then we're seeing different things kind of fall out of those that bundle them together and give you everything else that you're actually looking for as far as a business process and business design. So another thought that I'd like to introduce is the idea that there are actually multiple different types of communities even within an individual project. If you think about it, you have this upstream development community that is separate, not necessarily mutually exclusive, but separate from an enterprise community where the goal is to get things stable, performant, but not at the cost of bleeding edge brand new features. And then you have somebody like AT&T that is kind of in that gray area, blurring the line a little bit, trying to do pretty much both of them. That's right. So we actually recently decided that um, it was obviously very important to be able to contribute back into the community, not just be consumers of the open source uh, technologies. And so that means we've had to uh, really shift the way we um, appropriate our uh, resources and the work that they do. <clears throat> so we've actually hired um, people whose sole job it is to upstream into the open source community because we recognize that that's really the best way that we can help lead and change the industry and, com and contribute to that open source community and, and be a good partner there is by having people that are dedicated to that. Otherwise, if you start to have to have that same individual do upstream but also take care of the business and develop the um, at and in our case, specific services and, and technologies to, to deliver our services, that's gonna be um, very difficult and then the upstream process will just become slower. So we recently decided to really build up a team of folks that are dedicated to just doing that upstreaming. We then have, obviously, we also want to ingest what's out there in the community. And so we have also processes for ingesting uh, what comes out of the community and then adding you know, the, the secret sauce, if you will, of what we need to then develop that enterprise grade services and products that we need to offer. So we, we're, we've made a conscious decision to really dedicate resources to the upstreaming process and then have good processes in place to ingest that technology back in, add the secret sauce so that we can give the customers the services they need. The other thought from this particular notion is I get asked all the time, Hey, Rob, the community's not doing what I want them to do. How do I actually get the community to do what I want them to do? Well, the short is you, you don't. Um, you know, just because your company or your organization or you personally have paid into a platinum membership or, you know, made this investment with engineering resources, whatever that may be, it doesn't necessarily entitle you to come in with an iron fist and say, no, this is how it's going to be. This is how it needs to be. 
you know, if you look at an organization like Red Hat, for example, we are Platinum sponsors or the primary contributor to tons of different projects. And at the same time, you know, obviously I would love to be able to tell my customers, yes, you can have that feature on such and such day because, you know, we are the, the primary vendor involved, but at the same time, we still have to be good community stewards. We still have to be good community citizens and actually let the community find its own direction. Now, if the community is about to do something that's going to cause a fork or, you know, something along those lines, yeah, we'll step in and try to mediate, but we actually have, uh, individuals within Red Hat's payroll, very similar to AT what AT&T was just describing, what Alicia was just describing, that their entire job is to work in the community and make sure that the communities are staying together. We have community managers that is an entire team at Red Hat that keeps all of that rolling and keeps it all together. So what you'll find is you have this upstream community and then somewhere in the middle, You've got to take what's coming out of that upstream community and get it ready for your enterprise environment. You have to make sure that everything is validated, make sure everything, that everything is tested. If that's not going to be your organization, an organization like Red Hat provides that value, uh, you know, shameless plug, you're in a Red Hat given presentation. If you didn't expect that a little bit, I'm sorry. Uh, but by the time you get to deploy, you want to make sure that everything's pretty well where you want it to be. You want to make sure that you're not injecting source code straight into your production environment unless it's to fix a critical bug or security updates or things like that. So a couple things to keep in mind. Uh, open source lock-in does in fact exist. Just because something is open source does not necessarily directly equate to open standards. I see a lot of heads nodding. Mm. Sounds like some of you have some lessons learned here. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, especially when it comes to open source, is just because you can do something doesn't always mean that you should. Uh, I guarantee you that everybody has attended at least one containers talk uh, or seen something on a big screen involving containers since you've been here. If you haven't, where were you? Uh, that being said, you're not necessarily going to always try to cram an Oracle database in a container. Again, just because you can doesn't necessarily, well, that's a whole different conversation that probably will need to involve alcohol. Um, Open frameworks and open standards do lower the burden of this concept, but you can still get roped in. There's a lot of organizations that I've worked with in the past that actually jumped to OpenStack too quickly. They really needed something that was more of just a, uh, a framework to manage their virtual environment in, and because somebody had heard a buzzword somewhere, they jumped in with both feet, and now they've put all this investment in, now they're kind of locked. So, you have to make sure you have a plan just because something's in the open source community doesn't mean just go grab it and start using it immediately. The other thing to keep in mind is that as open source innovation continues pushing forward, your legacy environments are still going to be around. Anybody who thinks that the idea of containerization is going to reduce complexity in your environment is probably not terribly accurate. That's the nicest way I can put it. We know that there are legacy Unix systems laying around that are still generating revenue that you don't know what to do with because the guy who wrote the application left. If that doesn't resonate with you, I don't know what does. So you still have to make sure that as this innovation drops forward, you can manage everything in your environment in a cohesive manner, or you at least have a plan around it. If you don't have a plan around it, you're gonna flounder a bit. So again, we're both focused on service providers, sorry. Uh, realistically, though, this applies to pretty much every industry out there. Uh, this is one of those more architecture type things. Um, in 2016, this was the survey of the top four things that everybody was trying to do. Open source, being in a community, being a part of a community, and being able to allocate organizations to these communities is something that is going to help with these four things right off the bat very, very quickly, very, very easily. So everybody's got to evolve. And one of the big evolutions that we're seeing is organizations such as AT&T moving from a primary open source consumer model to an actual open source leader model and an open source contributor model. Yeah, so one of the things I wanted to share with you was some of the trends that we were seeing um, as a company coming along that really inspired us and motivated us to, to join in the open source community. And that was really the level of network data traffic that we were handling. So since 2007 till today, 
we have had an explosion of 150,000 percent increase in that network traffic. We handle on our network 117 petabytes worth of data a day. And we realized as a company that in order to keep up with the enormous demands um, of our network, we needed to be innovative, we needed to innovate quickly, and we knew we couldn't do it alone. This kind of scale that AT&T is dealing with uh, required massive collaborative effort, the kind of collaborative efforts that exist in an open source community such as uh, OpenStack. And so that's when we made the deliberate decision to go the you know, software-defined network route, go the network virtualization route, and choose to use OpenStack as our foundation for creating our at and integrated cloud environment for which we can then deploy our network functions and create the services that we want to be quick in terms of um, technological innovations to meet these customer demands and to do it at scale, because that's also very important. And so we used OpenStack um, to build out our at and integrated cloud. Um, as a result, last year, um, we won the um, OpenStack's uh, Super User Award, of which it was a, a great honor um, to have that happen to us. And um, it's a testament to the, to the team and to the communities uh, for that work. We're also a um, large contributing OpenStack operators group. We're a member of that group as well. Uh, so we really take this notion very seriously of um, not just being consumers of the, of the open source community, but contributing back into it. Um, we understand the importance of that because we cannot do it alone. As I said before, no organization can do it alone. If they try to, it will be suicidal. And so we've really made a concerted effort to, to move in that direction. Um, I don't know if this is where you'd want me to talk also about ONAP or a little later on, we'll save that. Yeah, go for it. Okay, go for it, okay. <laughs> um, so the at and integrated cloud is more of an example of uh, where we were predominantly initially big consumers of the open source community and we're kind of now um, making upstream contributions. But a few years ago, we also in this whole push towards software-defined networking, uh, developed a uh, platform called eComp, Enhanced Control Orchestration Management Policy. It's a mouthful. And um, think of it as a uh, network operating system for developers to build network applications. That's what eComp was. And we uh, developed it, we, our own folks internally, uh, we put it into production. It's been in production for about two years. And then we realized that, again, we can't do this alone. This has become bigger, and the interest for it has also evolved. We were getting other service providers and systems integrators asking us to open source it, because they also realized the value of being able to use this to help jumpstart their involvement in the SDN and NFE in, uh, world. And so we, in fact, decided to do just that. Um, and the team was told that we were doing this uh, sort of in the fall of last year. And we just released it into open source in April. So you can imagine the teams were, they couldn't believe the time frame we were given to do this. And there were definitely some lessons learned from that experience. Uh, we have since uh, deployed it. Um, and we, we had internally called it Open Ecomp, but then we partnered with um, OpenO. So this is an example that Rob was mentioning earlier about projects coming together. So Ecomp and OpenO got together to form ONEP. And that is the Open Network Automation Platform. You can look it up, you can become members, you can contribute, you can use it, you can download it. There's real source code out there. In fact, more than five million lines of code that we put out there in ONEP. And uh, we want it to be a healthy, vibrant community. It's the only way we're going to affect the industry. Um, but lessons learned for us in that process, um, not, not just the fact that we wanted to do it quickly and get it out there fast, um, but remember I said that we started this as an internal project, which meant that we didn't think about open source from the get-go. And I think it's very important when you're thinking about doing something kind of big, right, that you think open source right from the beginning that the code is written in such a way that you can uh, put it out there very quickly, that you don't have a lot of proprietary, service-specific guff in it, because that'll just make it 
that much more difficult to disentangle it. So we had a little bit of disentanglement that we had to do uh, in order to put it out there so that we would take out stuff that was service specific. Um, so that was sort of um, one lesson learned. And um, one of the other things that is important for any uh, corporation that wants to put things out there in open source is to um, have a process that makes that easy. We've had a process for open sourcing for, for as long as I can remember, and I've been with the company for 22 years. Um, there's a simple process for anybody who wants to open source some technology. Um, it's basically a template, you fill it out, your manager approves it, it goes to legal, they approve it, it's very simple. That's also a way of encouraging folks to contribute to open source. So uh, we've had now the experience of uh, being big consumers of open source, wanting to contribute back, merging uh, open source projects together to help lift the industry so that we can keep up with the pace and the demands that our industry is demanding. So most of this shouldn't come to, as a surprise to any of you, but just kind of a, a quick recap of who's actually consuming this. You're going to find open source pretty much throughout your entire organization, or you can, depending on how you proliferate it, how it looks in your environment. If you take an organization like AT&T, you basically can't go anywhere without hitting some type of open source combined with a proprietary solution somewhere in the mix. Um, what use cases? Uh, pretty much everything. Uh, we're seeing uh, SD, well, software-defined, just about anything. I mean, I'm pretty sure somebody's going to come out with a software-defined shoe uh, in the relative near future. So what is being used? How is it helping? These things range from very simple apl monolithic applications doing internal IT functions, whether that's you know, some type of HR system or uh, just your internal corporate email, all the way up to things that are incredibly complex uh, chained microservice applications that are providing core uh, and critical business functions. We're seeing them in pretty much every industry uh, out there today, from railroads, financials, telecommunications, uh, to the mom and pop shop down the street that happens to have a website with an Apache server running in the guy's basement. Um, I've definitely been that guy before. So what actually makes a community work? It's not just the fact that a whole bunch of people get together and say, hey, let's write some code and then we're all gonna use it. It's the fact that every single member has a responsibility to not only use that code, but also report back their findings. If you don't have a heavily technical organization where you don't feel like you could be a contributing member from a code perspective or an engineering perspective, that's perfectly fine. I am personally not an engineer that writes code. You don't want me near your code. I promise I've seen me try it, just it's bad. That being said, I do have experience doing documentation for upstream and open source projects. So getting involved, doing a quick YouTube video or how to. Uh, my work here at Red Hat has lent me to, you know, how to get involved if you're not a technical user. We have a lot of people uh, within the company that are very passionate about things and want to get involved but may not necessarily know how. So grab a piece of software. There's a couple of, uh, um, for my personal stuff, there's a webcam monitoring solution that's open source that happens to run on a laptop sitting at my house so that I can buy dirt cheap webcams uh, that are like 30 bucks and then I get an enterprise solution out of it because the open source software is behind it. So what do I do? I do the documentation on the cameras. Mm -hmm. to make. Basically I grab a camera that nobody has ever tried before and say, okay, does it actually work? Half the time it ends up going back to Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I can mark it off the list and say, no, don't buy that one. So there's a lot of different ways to get involved, both on a personal level as well as on an enterprise level. What you really want to do is tend toward the consume, test, and report. If you don't have the capability of fixing it, at least making sure that somebody knows that a fix is necessary, whether that's something as simple as a configuration error in the documentation or something as complex as the whole thing broke and now my wife can't watch Netflix. So are they successful? Uh, I, I believe given the fact that we are all in this room today, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, yes, um, the answer is yes, yeah. and yes again. <laughs> and um, you know, I was, when I was preparing my thoughts for today's talk, I was trying to think about you know, what is sort of one, one reason why uh, you or companies such as, you know, as, as large or maybe as at and or smaller should get involved in open source. And you know, one thing came to mind, and that is uh, complexity management. 
That was sort of the term that I thought kind of captured what we're trying to um, help with open source and getting involved in it. From my perspective at AT&T, we have this enormous customer base. We have the complexities of having to deal with you know, reliability constraints that are very strict. Uh, we have um, customers that are demanding innovations constantly. We have that big network data traffic that I mentioned. And we, we, we must be able to contribute and consume the, from the open source community in order to gain all the eyeballs that are looking at that code, all the skill sets and the resources that are available out there. We have a certain amount of resources and we have certain people with certain skill sets and uh, we make sure that those resources are appropriated in the right areas, but we don't have all of it. And so coming together um, as a community to contribute um, helps everybody to reduce their complexity um, and in the complexity of building these large enterprise grade sort of systems or even smaller ones for that matter. Right? It's always a good thing to have other eyeballs looking at it. Um, I was recently talking to one of my colleagues and asking him you know, about uh, open source and why that's important and, you know, and he prides himself and he is a, an extremely good uh, developer and he will admit that even though he might think that his code is really, really great and that he's gotten and plugged in all those security holes in it. When he puts it out there in the community, somebody will undoubtedly find a hole in it. And that's one of those beauties of being able to participate in that open source community. You have that, the, that somebody else is looking at over you and somebody is also keeping um, track of your back. And so from that perspective, it's very important um, to continue to evangelize the um, collaborative efforts that are required of building the kinds of services and systems that we want for the future. So a little bit about ecosystems. One of the things that we've seen a huge trend with recently is not only enterprises getting involved in open source, but also these partner vendors, the people who are actually providing the solutions. They're building their solutions either with open standards, on top of open frameworks. Uh, they are leveraging um, not only you know, Red Hat's open source, but AT&T's open source to try to provide best of breed solutions that are customized to industries and to other organizations. The real interesting part is when you get in some of these organizations and you find that your competitor is actually working on the exact same project at the exact same time. Uh, Red Hat does a pretty good job of playing Switzerland uh, in a lot of these arenas. But even we end up with, you know, OpenStack's a prime example. We have other competitors here doing talks. I mean, you're little lanyards, obviously. So based on that, you have to understand that within these communities, you want everybody else to be successful too. You just want to be able to do something slightly different with it once it's come out the other side, or you want to provide a different value, or you're trying to do something ever so slightly tweaked uh, to differentiate yourselves. So what are we actually paying for? Uh, so when you buy a commercially available open source based solution, you're not necessarily paying for somebody to say, yes, you can have whatever feature you happen to want. It doesn't work like that. What you are paying for is the engineering services. You're paying for the stability. You're paying for the scale. You're paying for the additional consulting services. Uh, you're paying for certifications because those are the types of things that you do need that third party organization to come in and provide above and beyond just a piece of software or an application that is going to end up running in your infrastructure. So how to get involved. We've already talked about a few different lessons learned. Now let's talk about the lessons learned of the first time you actually stick your toe in the water and say, hey, this is a new community. I'm gonna do this thing. I'm gonna join the mailing list. and I'm actually gonna respond to somebody. So we already talked a little bit about the actual model of consume, test, report, fix, et cetera, et cetera. So try something new. Respond to somebody. Worst case, you're wrong. The best part about being wrong in an open source community is somebody's going to correct you really, really fast. Engineers hate it when somebody's wrong. I will actually admit that occasionally I will respond to somebody and be ever so slightly wrong just to get somebody else to correct me and give like 17 more paragraphs of detail than I ever could even come up with. It works really well, just don't do it a lot. Um, give feedback. If you're not giving feedback and you're just consuming and something doesn't work, it's never gonna get fixed. 
you can't assume that somebody else is going to do it unless you see a bug report already open and then you can flag a me too on it and you know at least they know somebody else wants some help as well. Be open if possible with how and why. Obviously your organizations have you know trade secrets, enterprise security things that you have to keep close to your vest. But if at all possible, if you can give additional detail about the use case that you're trying to use, uh, what you're actually trying to make everything do within your environment, that's going to be tremendous for the developers and engineers going forward. Don't fork the code unless you have a really good reason. We're seeing so many projects out there, and we're already talking about the consolidation of projects. We already talked about one example today. If code continues to fork and people end up on separate streams, it becomes incredibly hard to maintain those separate streams, especially when you eventually potentially want to bring them back together. Remerging a, a set of forked code is incredibly hard. Uh, Red Hat helps our customers do it all the time. It's never simple. It's never a one-off. It's always, okay, we got to bring it back, and then we continue finding things that got tweaked ever so slightly in the process. And then do definitely engage with the community. Even if you're just monitoring the mailing list on a weekly basis, it could be a project that really only has a couple of updates a week, or it could be something uh, as big and powerful as ONAP or you know Nova or Neutron or SD or uh, Open Daylight or something like that, where just keeping up with the mailing list could potentially be a full-time job. Any closing thoughts? Yeah. So there was one thing that came to mind um, when we talk about open source and. And I've gone to several talks here at, at the OpenStack this week about um, uh, culture um, in an organization around open source. And it's very important, especially in large organizations like the one I'm in, um, to get alignment from all of the um, senior leadership and management uh, members of, your, of the team um, rallied around uh, open source, making sure that they're educated and understand the value, the business proposition as well, of getting engaged and involved, especially if you haven't done so before. It's important to get that, um, that buy-in, that realization, because you're going to need their support as you go through this process, because as you've heard already today, it's not easy. It does take effort. Um, but, and so you need that understanding and support from uh, senior management. Uh, so that was just one thing I wanted to put out there, because um, it's certainly something that I spend a lot of time doing, is you know, just doing that kind of education internally. Um, within the organization. Um, so finally, I think in closing, um, I would say that um, it's, for us, it's certainly been imperative to uh, get involved in the open source community uh, because we can't really take on the level of technological and industrial undertakings that we have been taking on over the last several years without getting involved in the open source community as contributors, um, as um, partners uh, with folks like Red Hat and others. Um, it is a must if we want to innovate in this technologically fast-paced uh, environment that we're in today. Okay. Awesome. Well, that pretty much wraps it up. I appreciate everybody attending. If you've got any questions, don't hesitate to uh, approach us afterward. Thank you. Thank you.